thanks for taking the time to download this BBC Radio 5 Live podcast. To search for other podcasts you might like, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live, where you'll also find our terms of use. Now, during this lunch interval, we're going to reflect on yesterday's sad news that former England batsman Tom Graveney has died. He was 88. He played 79 tests for England. He scored 11 test hundreds. He averaged 44 in his test career. In his first-class career, he made 47,000 runs and 122 first-class hundreds. It was the way he made them that stood out, elegant, graceful, a joy to watch. After retiring, he became a BBC television commentator and he served as the 200th president of the MCC in 2005. We can hear an interview now that Tom gave to our colleague Dave Bradley from BBC Hereford and Worcester, looking back over Tom's life. Tom Graveney played for Worcestershire, but he began his career in Bristol playing for Gloucestershire, and he explained he made a poor start to his career there. I don't think anyone had a worse start than I did. We only had 12 pros on the south, and Jack, old Jack Crap, was in the test team, the 48 test team against the Invincibles, the Australians, and uh, I'd got about 220 runs in my first 20 innings, which is not very good. I went all the way from number one to number seven. Then I bagged them against Derby at Bristol just before my 21st birthday. And I was left out on my 21st birthday. And the, Len, was having a, Len Hutton was having a little bit of struggle with the, uh, with the Aussie quick bowlers. And the selectors, believe it or not, dropped him and picked George Emmett from Gloucester to take his place at Old Trafford. And I, I said we had a very small staff and there was no one else to play down at Dean Park right. in, uh, in Hampshire. And uh, I went in and the ball was turning square and I got 48 against Charlie Knott and Jim Bailey and never looked back. <laughs> it was, I wasn't going to play the rest of the season. If that hadn't happened, I'm sure. Uh, so a, a, a lucky break, really, but you made the best of that. that oh, look. that's right, yeah. Suddenly everything dropped into place. Charlie Barnett and Andy Wilson were very good to me and very encouraging. And Charlie let me out. I couldn't find a bat, and Charlie let me have one of his, and it was a beauty. First time I used that was caught and bowled, wasn't it? It went off like a little bullet. But uh, at it, they... they they all looked after me, and uh, it, I turned the corner. I got uh, six, six, six hundred and odd runs in August, and uh, it went on from there. Do you remember when you got to, got to learn that you were in the pick for England for the first time? Yeah, well, that, that was uh, I, I got picked for the first time in '51 against South Africa at Old Trafford again, and uh, I only got in because Dennis Compton. Had been had missed a full toss and it hit him on the toe. It must have been the only one he ever missed in his life. <laughs> so that's why I think I'm lucky. <laughs> and he, he couldn't walk, so they called me up. We were we were playing on Courtauld's ground at Coventry, and I got the message to report for uh, to Old Trafford. What did that feel? What did that feel like when you when you got it? Yeah, you, you're a, you're now a Test cricketer. Did that? Feel wow. like? I was only only replacing one of the greats. Uh. Uh, but it, it was a f fantastic experience, and I, I can remember sort of going into the dressing room and looking round. There's Compton, Hutton, Bedson, Bailey, Jim, Johnny Eichen, oh, I mean, um, Alec Bedson, wonderful bowler. Cause he, he was such a good bowler because he did it mainly on his own. He had one or two bits of help later on in his life, but he was a great, great bowler. And I, I thought, quite honestly, I thought, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> but it, and it, 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 it turned out it was a square turner, but I managed to get 15, I think, in a, a very low scoring match, and we won. And then the, uh, I didn't expect to play in the next match anyhow, but on the uh, horizon came one of, the, I think, the, the best batsmen, purely pre-war batsmen, Peter May. 
mm. and he went in number three and Dennis went four and there wasn't room for me and I, I sort of I suppose you could say I made I made my way in on that tour to India, Pakistan and Ceylon mm. and it was uh, a, an opportunity because none of the none of the senior players would go to the subcontinent it was all was left to the might be's and has been's <laughs> uh, you know none of the big names went and I'd got a lot of I got a lot of runs in India and Pakistan so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna move you on a bit because you're in the test team you play well for Gloucestershire got a lot of runs and then you left Gloucestershire on, under shall we say a, a bit of a cloud very unfortunate really I mean I I, I nearly gave cricket up because of what happened it was one of those things they, they, I, I remember Sir Percy Lister rang me up and said come come down and have some lunch with me uh, and he dropped the bomb that they were going to change the captain in the, at the AGM uh, and replace me with uh, Tom Pugh who's a nice chap but not a great cricketer and I felt that I was getting the thin end of the stick because I just I just started the captain uh, lost uh, two years I did and uh, they were at the same time they were announcing a, a deficit of 15,000 pounds which was a lot of money in those days mm. so uh, the, the out the outcome was that I went to uh, the Duke of Beaufort, who of course was a, an enormous fan of Gloucestershire cricket, and I went to meet him with Sir William Grant, who was uh, chairman of the club, and Brother Ken, and uh, they agreed, we agreed a package, and I said I'd play with Tom Pugh. Well, I never got the letter, I never heard from him again, and when George Doughty rang me up and said come and talk to me at our court you're just what Worcester need because he was president here and he was also involved with the Gloucester club of course and uh, I said right I'll go to Gloucester but uh, go to Worcester rather and uh, unfortunately they wrote a in the press, they said, we wish Graveney well wherever he goes. And the same day, they wrote a letter to Lords making sure I didn't go. And I had to qualify for a year. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit, a bit of pill, but in the end, it, it did me good. Because I, I played for 13 years without a break. And uh, I knew Don Kenyon, the Worcester captain, very well. We'd be, we'd toured India together in 51, 52 and uh, they treated me very well here. I had to qualify for a year. I played in the Birmingham League for Dudley, played with Worcester seconds and joined the same day as Duncan Fernley actually oh, right. at Worcester. Yeah, yeah. So we've been great pals ever since and uh, then I went on a three-week tour to Bermuda at the end of it which was marvellous. Just before the start of the following year I went on a virtually a world tour with Ron Roberts side. We played all oh, New Zealand, India, Pakistan, South Africa and it really gave me a lot, you know having had a rest for a whole season or a virtual rest and uh, when I came here in 62 I was ready to go, and I had a good first year. And it, 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 well. it was a decent side that you came into as well. Here, oh, wasn't it? good side. I, I think they finished third in '61, didn't they? And it was only the uh, Yorkshire supporters that got their cars out up at Harrogate, mm. where it had been raining all night, and they they were mopping the ground up all night, and they bowled Glamorgan out for nothing twice, and pipped us by a few points. So that was the start of uh, my Worcester career. And I got back in the test team because I hadn't played for England for three years. Got back against Pakistan and went to Australia the following year. Um, Tom, we, we've got you here at Worcester and you're in that wonderful side of 1964, the championship winning side, first ever championship at New Road. That, 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 was, that, that was a good side, wasn't it? 99 years yeah. the club had been in operation. 
and uh, they were a hell of a good side because we had probably the best two opening bowlers in the country uh, together. Jack Flavel and Len Cold were a wonderful fielding side. I remember that that year we, the Roy Booth had a hundred victims behind the stumps, and Headley, Ron Headley, and Dick Richardson caught a hundred catches between them, fielding close in, and. We had the batters, Horton, Don Kenyon, wonderful player Don. But he, he uh, when I toured with him in uh, in India and Pakistan, he, he was homesick, homesick. Never showed his true form. And when he did play in England, he was unlucky enough to play against the two worst attacks you could possibly want. In 1953, he opened. Uh, twice with Len Hutton against Lindrell Miller Johnson and then the next time they picked him was against South Africa in 1955 with Heine and Adcock mm. and Goddard and Tayfield mm. so he was unlucky Don he, he, was, he had an unlucky England career but uh, he was the best captain I ever played under without any question it took him a couple of years to learn but he did it all himself. He might have the odd word with some of the senior players, but very little. He did it all himself, and he, he was a great man. Great man, John Kenny. Colwell and Flavel opening the bowling. Not bad, was it? But, well, they, 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 I mean, we won the championship when we were losing them. They were, they were playing for England. Yeah. Uh, and then we, of course, we had the magic Jim Stanton, yes. didn't we? Yeah. Top the averages. He took 64 wickets at 14 apiece. I think it was the relief uh, of the batsman not having to face Le Len, uh, uh, Len Coldwell and Jack Flavel, and they were a bit careless against Jim. But he, apart from anything else, he was, he was a fa fantastic fielder as well. I mean, in front of the wicket, when those two were bowling, we only had Jim on the offside, and he used to clear everything up. He was so quick, wonderful pair of hands. And uh, of course we had Colville, Flavel, Horton, uh, Norman Gifford, great cricketer Norman, tremendous competitor. Uh, and I mean, the four of them took a hundred wickets all together in one season. Mind you, we used to play a lot of cricket in those days. <laughs> we used to play I, I, a lot of cricket. I, I was saying the other day, you, you can't see Lennon Jack running around the ground a few laps before the start of play, could you? You wouldn't get me doing it either. <laughs> no, I, I, I used to have a, a method. I, I did the same thing every day of my life. I used to be up here early in the nets, and I always played properly in the nets until the last two or three minutes. I said, I'm going to play a few shots now. Have a few little bowl, bat catches, mm. cup of tea and just wait for the action and I did that all my life Out of that lineup, you left T.W. Graveney yourself, you always had time to play the shots where, where, did, where did that come from Tom? Was it natural or was it? It's given to you yeah. it's given to you uh, You know, everybody talks about being elegant and this and the other I, I've watched myself that, I didn't think I was very <laughs> elegant <laughs> But uh, it, it's it's given to you, and I, that's where I was so very lucky, mm. getting a late chance after winning a couple of championships here. We got Basil Dolivera back in the side. I, I I signed him on in the Metropole Hotel in Karachi on a Commonwealth tour at about three o'clock in the morning, and he was a bit of a useful player. I only signed three people on. For, uh, for Worcester Dan Van Holder wonderful chap and a fine bowler and Glenn Turner so uh, not a bad three really well I, I could pick a player when I I did pick Vaughan when he was a youngster as well Michael Vaughan he was a fine player so uh, yeah I, you know I was so happy you know, and it began to tail off a bit when, as I got older. But then, getting the opportunity after three years out in the just playing for Worcester, getting the opportunity on my 39th birthday to play again for England was just out of. I'd given it all up. I'd given up hope. 
but the lovely thing about it was it was also Basil's first test match and it was my comeback match and uh, I got a few runs against the West Indies that year and uh, played uh, I, I played it was my 39th birthday when I got back on the field and I played the next 24 test matches so I was 42 when I was playing the last game for England. Not bad, eh? And enjoyed it all. Oh, it's wonderful. I say, uh, I said at the start, you meet you meet so many great people, and the cricket fraternity are tremendous, tremendous. The supporters, the people that run the clubs, not many bad ones. If you could pick one thing, one day, one innings, one time in your life. You know, say at the end of it, that's that was the best. What would it be? Well, I suppose it's got to be that uh, Lord's Test match at the West Indies yeah. uh, when I hadn't played for three years. There was Wes Hall, Charlie Griffith, Lance Gibbs, and the best cricketer of the lot, Gary Sobers. He was a great cricketer. That man. I don't see how anyone could be better than he was, and a hell of a good bloke too. And to to get 96 in my comeback match, people, you know, were, were very, you know, they sort of said they were sorry for me because I didn't get 100. I said I'd have settled for 96 at the start. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Graveney, some of his memories of his life in cricket, speaking to Dave Bradley from BBC Hereford and Worcester a couple of years ago. I'm joined now by our cricket correspondent, Jonathan Agnew. Good morning to you, uh, Jonathan. Good morning, Simon. Can you assess uh, Tom Graveney's contribution to English cricket? Well, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, it's just lovely listening to his voice again. Uh, Tom uh, was always a regular at the hotel that I stay at when England play at Lords, and he and his wife Jackie were always there because, of course, he had very strong MCC connections, having been a, a president there. And many evenings would be spent sitting in the bar with Tom talking just like that. So he's one of those batsmen, um, one of those cricketers who's got one of these tremendous memories uh, for dates or scores, individual things, you know, he, can, he, can, he remembered things. Um, he, he was very much his own man, you know, I mean, he, he, he's always talked about as being a gentleman, and he's certainly that, and a very gentle man, listening to the way that he was telling his stories there, but, you know, when he go through his, his career, uh, there were certainly patches when he was out of favour, I think he certainly spoke up for himself. Um, and that got him into, well, not trouble, but, I mean, he, he had one or two uh, businesses along the way, shall we say, one that ended his career at the age of 42 uh, with Alec Beds, the chairman of selectors. But I think, you know, you talk about his, his career, I mean, he was one of those in that golden age of batting. I know people always well, talk about golden age, but come on, I mean, Colin Cowdery, Peter May, Ted Dexter, Tom Graveney, you know, that, that was a period of, of, of wonderful in, English batting. And Tom was known, I never saw him play, but for his style, for his elegance, um, in, in, in a way, his move from Gloucester to Worcestershire, one of the most iconic and beautiful cricket grounds, rather suited Tom's style of play by all accounts, you know, the backdrop of the cathedral. And the thing for me was he was, he was Christopher Martin Jenkins' favourite cricketer, and that's, that's good enough for me. Mm. Some players are respected, aren't they? And, and then some players are, are loved. What was it about Tom Graveney as a batsman that made cricket watchers love him? Well, I think what made Tom particularly admired amongst later generations of, of cricketers was that he was never a when we. You know, he, he, I think one thing that, that current cricketers always, or, or sportsmen always rather dislike, of, of, of former players telling how much better they were or how much better the game was when they played. And Tom certainly was not like that at all. Tom, you know, we would talk about the modern game with real warmth and enthusiasm. He was very generous uh, to his peers. You know, he mentioned uh, Peter May there very affectionately, where I think they had, when Peter May was captain of England, I'm not sure their styles necessarily got on well, but he, he was always very generous uh, in, in his, his admiration for, for others. And I think that's what made Tom... Um, particularly respected amongst amongst you know, those of us who came along later, if you like. Uh, and listening on the television too, he was always a very generous uh, commentator later on. But it was it was that style, that that, that grace, that elegance uh, that people talk about. You know, he and, and, and Wally Hammond's another one, you know, people talk about his his drive in the same breath they do Tom Graveney's. You, you mentioned his, his move into television, the television commentary. But what was he like as a, a television commentator? What well, again, I mean, he had his own. Well, he had his own style. I mean, he wasn't one of those who just rolled over and had, and had his uh, had his tummy tickled. I mean, not saying he wasn't Jeffrey, um, but you know, he still had his own. You know, he, he, he was quite forthright. 
you know, just as he was forthright, I mean, I remember particularly him being very strong about chuckers. He had his thing because, of course, he had this running with Charlie Griffith from West Indies. Um, and, you know, as Tom got a bit older, the, the, the Griffith story would come out more regularly. I think he'd forgotten he'd told it a few times. But there was this incident where, where Griffith, who, who many people believe was a thrower anyway, and certainly Tom did, and he'd often regale the story of this enormous West Indian fast bowler you know, opening up, going wide of the and hurling his beamer at him. I think he was at Headingley one year. And Tom only had a few runs. He reckon he almost killed him. Uh, and so he, he, I think because of that experience, particularly uh, bowlers who had, um, had incorrect actions or something that he was always very strong about. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Jonathan will be part of the te Test Match Special commentary team for the One Day and T20 series here. Jeffrey, Jonathan mentioned uh, Jeffrey then. Uh, Jeffrey's alongside me. They played uh, 16 tests together, uh, Tom and Jeffrey. Uh, in fact, uh, Tom Graveney's uh, final game for England was at Old Trafford, and you put on 128 for the third wicket with him against the, the West Indies. And you described him earlier on Test Match Special as your cricketing hero. Yes, he was. <coughs> That's why I believe that it would be good for cricket to some of the international cricket to be on terrestrial cricket because a lot of families can't afford it. And I think as a kid, yeah, you want kids to fall in love with certain England players and want to watch the national side. Tom Grady, he was my idol when I was a boy. And I'm luckier than most people. I actually got to play with him. 1966, that comeback test of his against the West Indies at Lords when he made 96. I actually, I was picked for that test. I wasn't picked for the first one. Nate Russell was. I was picked for that, and I made 60-odd. So, and I batted with him quite a bit, and I batted with him many times from then onwards. Um, so, I was lucky, and I saw the first ball that Charlie uh, threw at him and bounced it. <coughs> he got his glove to it, and it went down the leg side. I thought, for a fraction of a second, the keeper was going to catch it. He was going to get naught. And he just failed to get there, and it went for four, and he was away, and he, he batted beautifully for 96 runs. And he stayed in the side for a, for a while then. And the only time he lost his place was, wasn't it his benefit year with the Worcester? I think it was Old Trafford. Yeah. And we didn't play on a Sunday then. And he had a big match organised, and I think someone was paying him a £1,000 if he turned up to play, which doesn't sound a lot now, but let me tell you. A lot of money, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1969. When you were getting about £100 for playing a week's test match and somebody's going to give you hundred, you know, £1,000 for going and maybe making a charity 100 against easy bowling, but a lot of people turning up on a Sunday, well, Tom said no, he'd given his word he was, he was going to play because he couldn't be sure he was going to play for England. And... Uh, Selectors said, well, if you do, then it's against the regulations, the rules, and so they didn't pick him then. What was it about him that made him your idol? <coughs> the style. He could play front foot, back foot, and what he did, he did it effortlessly, gracefully, beautiful timing. He never lost that. <coughs> and I heard him say there that uh, when he was interviewed that uh, it's a gift, and I believe it is. Somebody to say to me, I mean, I heard you say it, the other day that you like watching David Gower bat. Who didn't? It was the graceful, the easy timing and style of him, and that's a gift. He didn't make that up. He didn't somebody, you know, tutor him when he was a kid. It's a gift. God gives you it. And Tom's right. He had a gift for looking elegant all the time, and his cover drive was exceptionally special. It just looked <laughs> like watching Michael Vaughan. It's beautiful. And uh, I remember... Len Hutton, one of the all-time great batsmen for England, everybody says was like Compton, one of the greats, and he apparently was a very good cover driver, but he used to, when he talks about Wally Hammond, he used to roll his eyes and go, Wally, oh, I thought Wally mm. was God, if I can say that without meaning to be disrespectful, but he like, oh, I thought Wally's cover drive was out of this world, and as a player, and Tom was like that, and, and I think it's right, I, I always want kids to see the national side, I want kids to like I did, fall in love with Jimmy Anderson's bowling, if you're a bowler, fall in love with Joe Root, Joe Root, oh, I want to be like Joe Root, why not? That's what it's about. And I think that's what the game has missed in the last number of years, which is, is not a slight on Sky, but it needs to be some of the international cricket so that you can fall in love like I did with Tom Graveney. What was he like in the dressing room? What was he like to play with alongside? Easy. Yeah, easy, um, no problems at all. He got on well with Colin Cowdery. He was quite a big friend with Colin, uh, so 
it's pretty easy. Went to West Indies when Colin was captain, and we won the declaration test in Trinidad. He was one of those with Ken Barrington, Jim Parks, and Tom. I can remember in the dressing room when Gary surprised us with the declaration, and we go in, and there's John Edge night <laughs> trying to get our pads on, and thinking, well, you know, are we going for these or aren't we? And we're waiting for a sign from the captain. And the captain's not so sure. <laughs> it's this kind of indecision. And this, Tom was one of those pleading with him, listen, we can get these. This is like an opportunity. You don't get many of these in test cricket. And uh, Tom was one of those. He was quite forceful. He wanted to win. He played in two championship winning sides of Worcester. Well, he's right. When he came, you know, what people do forget, <clears throat> current players and the people listening won't remember that when we played in the early years, the 60s, 70s, your contracts, you were like body and soul. You couldn't leave your county. You needed the county's permission. And you're going, what, under employment law today? Wow, how things have changed. And when he wanted to leave Gloucester, because he'd fallen out with the committee, whatever it was, I can't remember, and he went to go to Worcestershire, he was suspended for a whole year. One whole season, he had to play in the Worcester second team. Can you believe it? before he could play for Worcester and then they won the championship in 64, 65 and uh, Don Kenyon was there, Norman Gifford, two great bowlers, wonderful bowlers. Jack Flavel and Len Coldwell played a bit for England. If They were they were like Jimmy Anderson, fast medium, run a fast bouncy pitch at Worcester and if it hadn't been for Truman to stay them being great bowlers and playing a lot for England, they would have played a lot more and, and they won the championship. He was a, he was a wonderful player. Would you have liked to play like him? I mean, what, your, your two styles quite quite different. Would you like to play like him? No, I think you're born with what you what you've got, and uh, if you're clever enough, you hone it, you make it better, um, you do what you can. Look, I learnt to sweep. I wasn't a sweeper at ball. I wasn't taught to sweep. I learnt to sweep by watching him, Cowdery and Barrington. Barrington with an open stance, open chested, open two eyed. He used to hit the ball hard. Whoa really whack it. I thought I wouldn't play like that. And Colin Cowdery used to have the paddle sweep. Remember, being a slightly hefty, he used to like paddle it behind, come over it, and very fine. And Tom was a more elegant, I uh, sort of crossed between him and Colin Cowdery watching him bat. I liked batting with him. It was easy to bat with. And I think uh, our scorer is not here, but he says I've had some Great partnerships, long partnerships. And one we remarkable... Average about 70-odd, don't we? Yeah, and one remarkable fact, Geoffrey, you never ran him out as well. No, because he was a good runner, and so was I. <laughs> I can't help it if those at the other end didn't run as fast <laughs> yeah. as Dom, can I? W was Not he... my fault. W was he a... Give us a... What, what was it like in the 60s? That was before my time. W was Tom Graveney a big star? Hmm. Yeah, I was regarded as a, <clears throat> a top player. Really top player. I was saying to Andrew Strauss, who's come this morning, that <coughs> facts and figures take you so far. You can look at Tom's 120 odd hundred, you can look at his test career and what did he average and how 44. many. 44. That's pretty good. Mm. It's not just that. If you really want to analyse players, you've got to study what conditions they play on, what type of pitches, what type of attacks they face. Facing Limwall and Miller. You know, quite a few times. What South Africa, Adcock and Heine, West Indies, Charlie Griffiths and Wes Hall. And you want to look at those eras when there aren't too many great bowlers around. There are other eras. I mean, going to Australia and playing uh, Mecky, who threw it, who got done for throwing after beating England, and O'Rourke, who dragged, remember, again, many people out there won't remember, we didn't play under the front foot rule, we played under the back foot rule. And you stuck your back foot where the wickets are and the white line. And then if you dragged it two and a half feet, you were two and a half feet further down the pitch. And that's why the front foot rule came in. To stop all that, well, they had that to contend with. And there were all kinds of good bowlers around. Yes, you went to India at the time or Pakistan. That wasn't too difficult in those days, except you might be playing when you were pretty ill. And <laughs> that's not very good either. Uh, you know, because you did long tours, you did up country and so forth, and that's where you got sick. It wasn't in the big cities for the test. So when you had to go up country and you were out there three or four months. So, yeah, they should look at not just statistics. It tells you a lot, and there's never been a top player without good statistics, but it doesn't tell you everything. There's one final question for you. What was Tom Graveney like? I have to ask you this. What was he like on uncovered pitches? Brilliant. 
because he had a great technique. Yeah. Grew up on him. It's a wonderful technique. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Top indeed. batsman. Yeah. Can't get anywhere further than that. Absolutely top player. Well, if he's your idol, he, he must have been uh, something really special. I mean, I've never I had don't the privilege of seeing him bat. Trust me, I don't pick rubbish. Thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey. Well, Tom Grave not only played for Worcestershire from 1961 to 1970, he was also the club's president from 1994 to 1998. And the club's chief executive, David Leatherdale, joins me now. Can you hear me, David? I can indeed. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. What's been the, the reaction uh, around the club to the news? I mean, I know you're sort of in your, your winter break, but what's been the, the reaction that you've picked up? Um, well, we've obviously found out late uh, yesterday afternoon from uh, Tom's son, uh, Tim, and um, Tom had not been well for some time, as many people would know. So he's been battling Parkinson for, Parkinson's disease for many years. Um, but he was at the ground in July at uh, the Whopper Day, our Worcester Old sort of Players Day, and um, in relatively good spirits. Um, so, yeah, there's been uh, a fairly sort of heavy reaction to it. Um, as listening to Jeffrey sort of talk there, he was uh, very much the catalyst of success for Worcester in 64 65 and uh, talks, uh, talks fondly about the club in everything that he did and everything that the club did, and uh, very much saw this as his home. What about his, his general contribution to, to Worcestershire cricket? I mean, it, it didn't stop when he stopped playing. No, definitely not. As you say, he was, he was president. Um, he sat on the club's uh, board for a, a number of years and would be a regular visitor to the sort of dressing room. And uh, again, sort of Geoffrey talking about technical things, and he would he would come in in the latter days. He would come to the dressing room and pick players' cricket bats up and uh, um, and say, "Blimey, they're slightly different to uh, to what he used to play with." And in his own words, people would describe as a toothpick. But he uh, technically wise, he was uh, he definitely one of the uh, the best players that uh, we've seen, and and his statistics certainly speak for themselves. How important was it to you as a, a young player at the club when you uh, joined Worcester to be able to talk to someone like that, an England legend, actually to have someone like that around the club? Yeah, I mean, we, we had uh, in the sort of 60s and 70s uh, the, the Giffords of this world and, and Norman is actually still with us. He's still uh, sort of coaching, 76 years old and coaching our, uh, our spin bowlers. And um, I sit and talk to him now and you talk about the sort of old days and, and the Don Kenyans. We've got Roy Booth, obviously, that was part of the 64-65 the setup as well, who's, who's still with us, who, uh, who sits in, the, in our, our boardroom most of the summer and, uh, and watching cricket. And, uh, and everybody eulogises about sort of Tom and the way that he played. Um, he was a sort of different player. Um, he wasn't uh, seen as a sort of big, big hitter of the ball, but... Um, he timed it as sweetly as anybody and everybody talks about his top hand I think where uh, nowadays his technique would be seen as well you wouldn't play like that anymore because his top hand is very much so far around the top of the bat that it would be almost impossible to play like that with the type of bats that uh, players play with but the influence of being able to uh, have somebody just walk in the dressing room and have a chat which is what Tom was very good at there were no airs and graces with him he was just generally was the, uh, the gentleman of cricket and Worcestershire and, and loved by the members, presumably, as well, because he, you know, he was part of the club and he was seen around the club a lot. Yeah, he, would, he, was, he wasn't just somebody that came in as a president and what might be seen as a sort of figurehead. He, he would be here for sort of 50% of the season, which is, uh, is what he loved, and nothing pleased him more to uh, sit on the, the old balcony of the uh, old dressing room and pavilion that we obviously had here before we changed a few years ago, and, and he would sit there for hours and he would just talk cricket. And, um, but he was... He was very supportive. He, he was not someone that talked about uh, when he played and this, that and the other, the, the old thing. He would talk about what players were doing now and, and the latter-day cricketers. And one of the big things he talked about that had changed uh, was obviously fielding. He, he would comically talk of, well, batting and bowling. We played against some high-quality cricketers and we played on uncovered wickets, as uh, you've also talked about. But he said the fielding nowadays has improved so much and he, he used to come in and talk to players and say, oh, we, we never did that in our day. We'd have bowlers sat on the fence at third man 10 yards to the right before. And, but he talked really positively about the latter-day cricket as opposed to what happened in his era as well. Are you going to do something as a club to, to mark his passing? Well, at, at the moment, uh, there is a sort of private funeral planned for a couple of weeks' time, I gather, and uh, we'll be talking to uh, the family. Um, but the plan is to do some form of memorial service, uh, potentially in the new year, possibly at the start of next season, um, which uh, will get planned over the next sort of few weeks um, once we speak to the family. David, thanks very much indeed. That's David Leatherdale, the Chief Executive of Worcestershire, talking about uh, Tom Graveney, who died yesterday at the age of 88. He played 79 
test matches for England, 1100s, averaging 44 on those 47,000 uh, first-class runs, 122 first-class hundreds made with uh, elegance and grace. A joy to watch uh, those who did see him play. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live.